So, Paul, we've just finished a wonderful event with you, with uh, Ampetafor, John McDonnell, Eva Jasiewicz, Len McCluskey. Last night, um, Ian Lavery said that this was a revolution. Is it, and what does that mean? Look, I think, actually, the Labour government we want to install will be actually quite moderate on a world scale. It will do, you know things that are roughly equivalent to what we'd call Swedish social democracy. You know, like um, a national care service, um, an education service from, you know, from, from 4 to 18 that gives everybody formal rights. But because we've had 30 years of neoliberalism, it will feel revolutionary. Because if you're trying to reimpose the logic of human life, of, uh, of need, of also proportionality, you know, so that you don't get massive, uh, dis massive differences between the rich and poor. That feels revolutionary to uh, a society that's had only the market imposed on it for 30 years. So part of our job has to be actually to try and convince people it, it isn't a revolution. It's simply the end of an, e of an economic model that no longer works, that is on life support, that is zombified, and that needs to end. Scale of 1 to 10. 10 being absolutely kaput, how dead is Blairism? Oh, Blairism is kaput, dead. I mean, Scale you know... One to, ten, one to ten, is it? De 10. And, you know, it's 10 dead because, because it's remaining uh, supporters and there are a few sort of younger second-generation Labour MPs um, who, who just genuinely think it was a good idea. What they can't do is they don't have a theory of their own failure. See, if you, if you do something and you fail, or on, the, on the famous adage, you know, try again, fail better, you at least want to know what went wrong. And the real uh, hole in, in, in the logic and rationale of the Labour right is that they don't have an explanation of what went wrong. It's as if, like, a meteor hit them, and, they, and it, that's the only explanation, the meteor being 2008, the financial crisis. And yet, if you look at it, they fueled it. Tony Blair, 2005, IPPR speech. Um, why is the, why is the uh, Financial Services Authority heavying the banks? They've done nothing wrong. Uh, Ed Balls, we want uh, massive deregulation. Ed Balls said, you know, while investors are constantly pushing us for greater safeguards, city friends, we're not going to do it. We will always do it to your uh, satisfaction. And then Gordon Brown, golden age of finance. It's as if they, it's as if like a sort of they. It's a painful experience, and our bodies often try and forget painful experiences. Blairism had the painful experience of causing the world to blow up. I'm afraid that's partly what it did, and then it wants to forget about it. So, you know, I, I just the the bit the kit of parts, the bit that says you know be in NATO or which is uh, I'm pro NATO, but the the bit that says uh, see there's no a very interesting thing that says we you know fuck students, let's concentrate on helping the poor. Right. That's a neoliberal logic. Right. All right, why? Because Milton Friedman used to say, any universal service um, benefits the rich more than the poor. That's straight out of Milton Friedman's you know, textbooks of neoliberalism. And yet you hear it from the younger neoliberals as if, well, I genuinely think they probably don't even know where it comes from. We stand for universalism, universal human rights, universal rights to, to services. And yes, of course, if the, if the rich person gets the same right as the, as the, as, as the poor person, uh, fine. Because what does it do? It gives the rich person a stake in society. And this was the problem with Blairism. It, it, it accepted that the rich and the poor had different stakes in society. You've talked about capital flight being one of the major problems for a Corbyn government in its early well, months. Let's hope it's not. Of course, but it, it could be for any government. Yeah. Of course, it was talked about before Brexit as well. Who would you like to see at the Bank of England uh, as the governor? Because <laughs> uh, well, that would be obviously it has to be impartial, but it would be political in the sense that this would be a new kind of uh, well, politics no, see, being think, championed in a Western I, I democracy. Think, I think you could do it with the existing uh, governor. It depends if he wants to do it. Because um, already Mark Carney stepped away from the, the, the informal logic that Mervyn King, the previous Bank of England governor, uh, operated. See, when Alistair Darling was doing... Uh, counter-cyclical measures, that is, he was trying to boost the economy to, to prevent the financial crisis collapse in the economy, Mervyn King said, well, basically, for every pound of stimulus you do, I take a pound out of the economy through, um, through, through my... Uh, I can take a pound out of my economy through raising interest rates. Mervyn was constantly threatening to raise interest rates in a crisis. Now, 
Carney gets it. Carney gets that the central banks can only keep this going for, for so long and we need a new economic model. He just doesn't say what the new economic model is. But I do think, you know, McDonald, John McDonald announced today there's going to be this strategic investment board. What that's designed to do is to pull the, 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 the chancellor, the, the head of the business and investment department, which I hope will become like a big economic management department, and the bank governor into a joint decision making that prevent one arm pulling a lever this way when the other is pulling it that way. You've all got to pull all the levers at once. And the bank, it, bank, central banks are effectively already arms of fiscal policy. They can remain independent. The governors can, can exercise ju judicious uh, oversight. But they do have to understand that their role is, is to help us transition the economy to a very different, uh, a, so a, de a very different set of dynamics are running growth. Mm. Final question, we'll stick this straight on Twitter. People may be watching what's going on, Labour Party Conference, TWT, very inspired. I hope they what, are. What one or two books would you recommend to them? They're new to politics. Try and read this, stretch yourself, learn uh, something you maybe feel un uncomfortable or think you feel uncomfortable about, um, and maybe, uh, you know, build, build some knowledge. All right. I think oh, it's, it's so difficult because I think, you know, I would almost say, you can almost not get this book, but it's called The Attack by R.H. Tawney, Richard Tawney, who was a, uh, a Labour, sort of quite centrist, and he's often seen as the kind of godfather of Blairism in a way. But Tawney basically writes, the, the attack refers to when he got shot in World War I, and he's lying in a trench thinking, I'm dead. And he comes out of that and he thinks, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change the world. And, and then the rest of it is, is you know, quite obscure, but quite understandable um, arguments which say this, Labour either is a cause or it's nothing. Either it's an aim to transform society or it, it's going to just fail. And he goes through everything we know, you know, people who are, you know, you go into Parliament, then you're in the Lords, and he just goes like, we've got to stop this. We've got to have a, I mean, unfortunately at the time they used to say, use the word crusade, which we can't use, we shouldn't use. But he said either it's a crusade or it's nothing. And you can read that. Um, I'd also say, Take inspiration from the great stories, which are not fairy stories, but the great stories of, social, of people's experience in social transformation. And one thing that we, when I was in the Labour Party Young Socialists, we used to read a book called Out of the Night by a guy called Jan Valtin. And he'd been a, a youth in Germany during the German Revolution after World War I. And if you just read, he became a spy for the Soviet Union and all sorts of weird shit, basically. But read that, read the life stories of people who've done it. Because it makes you realise the one thing, the one thing I keep here is the chant of the students and the workers on Tiananmen Square, yeah, in 1989. Do not fear tyranny. Never fear it. You can always defeat it. Legend. Thank you, Mike.